Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is good to see you. I'm Jamie Beckett. It says right down there that I'm the ambassador from the Eastern U.S. I would not believe that if I were you. Tonight is February 14th, and we're going to do Ask an Ambassador episode 55, along with my good buddy, Pat Brown from Texas. Hey, hey Pat, welcome to the party. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to you be know, anywhere at this age. You know, I got to say, Pat, it, there are people under the impression that this is Valentine's Day, and this is critical information, I think. Our topic tonight is weight and balance. And since we have a predominantly male audience, not entirely, but predominantly, I think it's very critical to, to warn them as they get all excited about this topic, which they undoubtedly will, do not turn to your mate and say, hey, do you know how much you weigh? Because that, <laughs> that's just going to ruin the night. So <laughs> we are talking so about true. weight and balance. So as always, we'll talk about anything you want to talk about. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. You can go ahead and put comments in the chat. We will answer your questions because we're just that needy. But, you know, Pat, I think we got to discuss the elephant in the room before we really get going here. This is the last episode of ask an ambassador because while my title there still says ambassador eastern u.s i'm not an ambassador anymore and neither are you what what are you doing these days bud well as you can see on the bottom of the screen it says aopa foundation scholarship mentor and i gotta tell you jamie i couldn't be more excited about it um i get to work with uh Right now, a number is about 250 kids that we have given scholarships to over the last couple of years, totaling several million dollars. And uh, come uh, April, when the new cohort or group is announced, uh, there'll be about another 140 of them. And, and I get to work with these kids day in and day out to kind of shepherd them through their, uh, their, their flight training experiences. In the last year, we have, uh, we have uh, out of the 140 in the most recent group, uh, well over 40 of them have gotten their commercial, their uh, private pilot certificate. Uh, several of them have gotten their commercial. A few have gotten their CFIs and a whole bunch of them have gotten their instrument ratings. This is all for AOPA scholarship money. And the, uh, uh, the application uh, deadline was, I believe it was Friday of last week, if I'm not mistaken. And so I'm, I can't wait to see, uh, you know, the quality group of, uh, of young folks we have coming to us in, uh, in April. So, and that's what I'm doing. And I'll tell you what, I, I love it. I, I got to say, that's one of those underreported things that I don't pe think people get beyond the fact that AOPA does give scholarships to people to get into aviation, stay in aviation. But I don't think they realize there's somebody of your caliber on the other end of the email or the phone line. So some kid, some teacher can call up and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this or I don't understand this concept or how do I get to that part of my training? You yeah. know, to have somebody to talk to who's got the experience, and you're really good. I'm not sucking up to you because you're a thousand miles away. It's not like you're going to give me a cookie or anything. But, you know, having that out there is just fantastic. And I'm really pleased because you're a great fit for that gig. I appreciate that, man. What are you doing? You know, I get to work with kids, too. My new title is the High School Aero Club Liaison, because as you know, I actually do spend a fair amount of time working with high school aero clubs where they they do restoration on aircraft, they do maintenance on aircraft, some of them actually fly the aircraft. And, you know, it's a great way to get kids inside the fence into yeah. a hangar where they feel like they're home. This is their space. They get to do so much more than restoration and maintenance and fly, though. They learn management skills. They learn inventory management. They learn the finance part. They le learn leadership. Yeah. Well, we have a 16-year-old kid who's the project lead on the rebuilding of a J3 Cub that's all the way down to the bones. I mean, these kids really learn how to do things. And it's gratifying, Pat, because they start to change. They come in as 14-year-olds looking at their shoes, kind of shuffling around and mumbling, and they don't make eye contact. And a couple of years later, they're like, oh, yeah, I, I know how to put that cylinder on there. Let me go get you the wrench. It, it's it's a whole thing. They develop confidence in themselves and a wherewithal. That's, I'm, I'm just glad we get to do this. You know, being associated with AOPA for me, and I'm sure for you, has been a tremendous gift. Just the best. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't say it better, Jamie. Could not say it better. Well, you know, I, I think it it's incumbent upon us at this point to say it wasn't just you and me, although... Well, maybe it was. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. There were other people. First of all, there's the inimitable Donnie McKay, who's on the other side of this 
system, keeping all the mouse on the gerbils on on the wheels turning, <laughs> all the interwebs work. <laughs> but you know, there were at one time five ambassadors, including Case Underham, of you all have seen here. Uh, Andy Miller up in the Midwest and Norm Eisler from New York. In between us, we were able to accomplish an awful lot in eight years. Is there something you're particularly proud of in that list of accomplishments, Pat? Oh gosh, Jamie, you know we we uh, we're we're closing in on twelve thousand rusty pilots, and I remember when uh, when I got a call from Br Brittany Macholka. Um, oh gosh, it's been probably eight years ago now, seven, eight years ago now, asking me if I wanted to write the Rusty Pilot Seminar. And if, and I said, of course. And, and she said, take, you know, choose one of your fellow ASI presenters, because at the time I was just doing contract work for AOPA. So I, I called Mark Grady and I said, hey, you want to work on this project? And and he jumped right into it because he's got a lot of audiovisual experience. And so we... Uh, so together we wrote that original version of the Rusty Pilot Seminar and uh, tested it for about, oh, seven, eight months and looked like it like, like it had legs. And so headquarters got involved and kind of fancied it up and slicked it up a little bit so th that uh, it covered all the bases we needed to cover. And that's pretty much what, what's being presented today with the course updates and things like that for changing regs and those kinds of things. But, you know, getting, getting almost 12,000 uh, rusty pilots back in the air you know man i'm awful proud of that yeah i gotta admit i've, I've had the good fortune to present that rusty pilot with you and apart from you a good number of times and it is really great to meet all those folks and kind of soothe their fears that it's not that tough to get back to it and really get them headed in the right direction you know one of the other things we did that i am really proud of because i kind of gravitate to this more than 200 flying clubs exist in, in the United States now because of the ambassador's service and also Steve Bateman and Drew Myers back at headquarters who specialize in that. But it's been a remarkable run. You know, it's so rare that you get to do something professionally that you believe really matters, that actually helps people and you get to meet them face to face. So yeah. what a yeah. run. And I'm, I'm glad we're still here just doing different things. But we already advertised asking ambassadors, so we kind of got to do episode 55, don't you think? <laughs> I think before any further ado, let's jump right into it. Well, as always, Pat and I are going to talk about weight and balance because I'm weight challenged and he's very good at balance. But you can ask a question on any topic you want. We're perfectly fine. Give me a thumbs up in the YouTube chat and uh, give me a wave in the Facebook chat so we can see that you're here. Um, I know we got Alejandro and Ted McDavis out there. So just let us know you're there. And if you've got a question or if we're not clear, feel free to slap us around a little bit and bring us back on topic. And, and hey, Jamie, let me, let me just interrupt just for a second here because Ted Ted uh, just passed his instrument check ride. Oh, wow. Uh, let's see. I guess it was Saturday afternoon, about uh, about 5.15 Central Time. I handed him a brand new shiny temporary certificate with his, his uh, instrument rating on there, and we did it in a Bonanza A36 with a glass panel. It was sweet. You're saying it was about 5.15, not, not 5.17 or something? It was well, to be well, it was five fifteen thirty to be quite specific, <laughs> but you know that's that's picking nits now. I get it. Well, hey, we got Mary Martin and James Goodman and Bruce Miller on YouTube. I like that. We got Alejandro and Ted, the new instrument rated pilot on Facebook, and a, and a bunch of other folks. So continue, but Pat, you know, I feel compelled to mention weight is actually one of the four forces of flight. It is sort of a big deal in aviation, and <laughs> that uh, it is. I don't think there's a whole lot. You, there's there's this uh, misconception, things like the Cherokee 6 or a few other airplanes where they're like, oh, if you can close the door, it'll fly. That is not a good rule of thumb, in my opinion. <laughs> not at all. Just because you got four seats or six seats or whatever. Go ahead and try filling them up and see how well that works. <laughs> yeah, that, that's absolutely true. By the way, I have to come claim to the folks when I was writing up notes for today's episode, I really thought it was important that we touch on LSAs, light sport aircraft, because they're really out there in large numbers, whether yes, the are. legacy ones or the newer ones are terrific. And I was smart enough as I was multitasking, which humans cannot do, and I still try it anyhow. 
I actually wrote to Pat that LSA's weight limit is 1,240 pounds, which is what, Pat? Incorrect? Oh. It's wrong. <laughs> not just yeah, incorrect, Jamie. Like not just incorrect. You're just wrong. <laughs> yeah, flat out wrong. No kidding. Big time Texas mistaken. Yeah, light sports have a weight limit of 1,320 pounds. Yep. Uh, if it's a seaplane, they get a little bit extra. They get up to go up to 1,430 pounds. Right. But, you know, that weight limit is a real weight limit. There's a reason that's there because the structure – is stressed for that. And, you know, I think that's one of the things people don't get, Pat. We could go flying in that light sport and load it up to 1,400, and it's okay. It'll fly, and it probably will. But then you get into turbulence, and you start racking up the Gs. That's the difference between 1,300 at 2, 1,320 at 2 Gs and 1,400 at 2 Gs is a big difference. That's just one of the reasons we have to think about this, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, there's, you know, all, all of these airplanes that are built generally are built with a little bit of a fudge factor in it, if you want to call it that. But, you know, if you start overloading an airplane, um, even though it, I'm, I'm sure it will fly. Um, in fact, it's, it's a well-known fact that, that uh, uh, some of the LSAs that are limited to 1320 here are, are, are limited to much more in Europe, 100, 100, 200 pounds, some in time in Europe. And, and it's well known that there are folks here, specifically with light sports, that will fly them. They euphemistically say, I fly them fat. But um, but the problem with that is that uh, regardless of what airplane you're, you're flying, if you fly it fat, then you are at that point a test pilot. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I would not say I'm qualified to be a test pilot. So, um, when it when it says the upper limit is 3,600 pounds or 2,400 pounds or 2,932 or something or whatever those numbers are 13, 20, 14, 30, um, I'm I'm starting to do some real careful calculations uh, when I especially when I think I'm going to be getting close to those numbers. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, we came back from uh, came back from Denver uh, several months ago from a family wedding and I flew uh, I flew the Comanche up there. And my wife and I were there in, in the airplane. Uh, my son wanted us to take his golf clubs uh, with us because he was flying commercially and wanted to play some golf up there. So, okay, we've got golf clubs. So we ran the weight and balance. Everything was just fine. Well, then he told us on the way when we were coming home, he said, hey, I want, I want to ride with you coming home. I didn't take that into account. So we actually had to ship his golf clubs via UPS and I ran a real, real careful weight and balance before we took off from Denver with a density altitude that day of 6,500 feet with three of us on board, a normally aspirated Comanche. So it all worked out just fine. We were, we were 200 pounds under gross and it all worked out just fine. But I'm telling you something, uh, watching that density altitude creep up a little bit and knowing how much weight we had on board and how much runway we had available, uh, there were some real close calculations going on there. And that's you know, that's story. a really interesting point because people often don't think about the thing they haven't experienced. Yeah. You know, I, I live on a big sandbar in Florida. I'm basically at sea level. So I'm always, I'm, my density altitude is rarely over 2000 feet. It doesn't make a huge difference, but you know, as you say out West, it's, it's going to be a big deal. Most people who fly smaller aircraft really don't recognize that aircraft have a maximum takeoff weight and, Larger aircraft have a maximum landing weight, which is less than the maximum takeoff weight. Yeah. That can become a challenge. But, you know, when I used to write study materials for the fine folks at Glime years ago, I used to get a lot of people, even CFI applicants, who would write in and they disagreed that a heavier airplane doesn't require a higher takeoff speed because they're like, the takeoff speed is the takeoff speed. And, and check me out on this and see if I'm thinking right. I believe it's because say I'm flying a PA-28 or a Cessna 172 and I've got my VX or VY in mind. Well, the difference between my heavyweight and my lightweight might only be 100 or 2 pounds. Whereas if I get up into a 777 or a 747, the difference between the lightweight and the heavyweight could be hundreds of thousands of pounds. We don't see the difference a whole lot when the difference is just 100 pounds or so. But when it's hundreds of thousands, you sure do. So a heavier airplane really does 
have a higher takeoff speed. And you've got to take that into account, especially as you say, you're, you're flying at a high density altitude, not only a higher speed, but a longer run. The, you might be saying, Oh, I've used 3,500 foot runway a lot of times. Well, if the density altitude is 8,000 feet, maybe that's not going to work. Well, you know, as you were talking about that, that was exactly what was going through my mind is, is you certainly are going to have a longer takeoff run, which is why it's important to calculate your density altitude uh, when you take off. Um, uh, you know, in, in Denver, I had 8,000 feet of runway, and um, I'm trying to remember what the, what the number was, I, what I calculated, but it seems to me it was probably close to 3,000 or 3,500 feet. Um, oh, and by the way, the runway went uphill slightly, uh, just a little bit, but you can tell. Um, um, but I'll tell you, as, as I as I throttled up, and and we were going, uh, I would normally say we went rocketing down the runway, but no, <laughs> uh, it was a very very slow acceleration. And uh, uh, I mean, we got we got there, but uh, uh, but the climb was was kind of anemic. The best I could do was about 400 feet a minute, and. And uh, normally that airplane pulls 28 inches of manifold pressure at sea level and full throttle uh, was 21 inches. So um, wow. you really and truly do lose one inch per thousand feet, one inch of manifold pressure per thousand feet, the higher you go up in a normally aspirated non-turbocharged uh, type of an airplane. So it was a little bit of an anemic, an anemic uh, uh, climb, but, uh, and, the, and the takeoff run was definitely, definitely uh, a longer. You know, that's the thing. The high density altitude and an overloaded airplane really have about the same effect. The performance just isn't there. Your climb will not be nearly as sprightly yep. with the heavy airplane as it is with a light airplane. And it's darn noticeable. Yeah. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, max max takeoff and, and whatnot. And and one one term that, that you will see uh, from time to time is max ramp weight. Um, and sometimes that's different than the maximum takeoff weight. Um, oh, we should ask if anybody knows the reason and put it in the comments. Oh, that would be good. If anybody knows the reason why max ramp weight and maximum max gross takeoff weight might be different, put it in the comments. We'd love that's to hear it. That's a tricky question. Thank you, Grandmaster Pat. And, and you didn't even have to pull up the FARs or anything to do that. You just had it right there. <laughs> no, I, I'm going to have to do all that memory right now because it's in the closet. The, the FAR book's in the closet. Right now. That's a good point, though. There, there's, there's more than one number when we talk about weight, and there's really good reasons for it. You know, we, we're talking about the performance of the airplane, but it, it also affects things like the range. Maybe you've made this trip from A to B that was 300 miles repeatedly solo, but now you've got a spouse and another couple with you. That may not be the case. I mean, you're going to have to burn more fuel to maintain the same speed, altitude, all that. Yeah. Um, what, what's another factor you can think of where weight can adversely affect, and I mean increased weight, can adversely affect the aircraft? Well, I mean, the, the placement of the weight in the airplane can have a, a pretty big impact on it. Uh, let's let's just say that you're loaded towards the forward uh, edge of the, the CD, the, you know, the forward limit uh, of the CG envelope. Uh, the airplane is going to be uh, pretty stable, um, be pretty easy to recover from a stall, but uh, you're going to be running around with a higher angle of attack, puts you closer to the stall speed, and um, uh, you're going to be slower um, because of that increased angle of attack. Um, conversely, if you put the weight uh, closer to the aft CG, and, re and remember, I'm not talking about exceeding the forward, forward or aft CG limit, but if you put the, uh, the, the weight uh, uh, concentrated uh, more towards the aft CG, then the airplane is going to be somewhat less stable. Um, it'll recover from a stall, but, but, uh, um, but you don't have as much nose down moment as, as you would if it were for a forward CG. But, you know, the upside is that the airplane will be more, uh, more efficient flying through the air. You, you can fly faster, uh, more efficiently. Um, you get more range out of, out of the fuel that you've got. So that might be one way to look at counteracting, carrying the, the, the let's say, that extra, uh, extra people and baggage 
if you can uh, arrange the airplane so that that uh, that it's loaded sort of towards the, the rear CG, not outside of it, but sort of the rear CG, then um, then the airplane will be a little bit more efficient. Now, you know, we're talking about a, a light aircraft like a you know 172, 182, something like that, where in reality, it's probably not going to be much difference in terms of the performance of the airplane from the forward to the FCG. But when you start getting into a bigger airplanes, um, like let's say a Bonanza A36 or a Cherokee 6 or a uh, Cessna 206 or 207, um, a Centurion 210, you know, where, where you have more room to put people and things, um, that that could end up being a, a, a fairly dramatic uh, dramatic difference. And, and, you know, when we're running our numbers, you want to run, not only do you want to run your maximum uh, takeoff weight numbers in terms of CG, but you want to run some numbers as you get close to being uh, depleting, de depleting your fuel. Um, there are some airplanes where the CG goes down and forward, a little bit. There's some airplanes when it goes almost straight down, and a lot of LSAs are that way. Particularly, um, particularly uh, some of the ones in Europe where you're where you're sitting almost on the CG. But there are some, notably some of the uh, uh, Beechcraft products, where the the, the uh, CG actually moves down and and back. So if you were kind of loaded towards the aft CG to start with, and you happen to have one of those airplanes where as you burn fuel. Not only does the dot go down, but it goes backwards. You could find yourself out of the CG limit on the aft end, which is incredibly dangerous. So um, that's that's probably a little bit more than you ask for. But uh, you know, as long as we're yeah, talking but it's good stuff. I you know, actually have a trick that I learned years ago. If I'm taking a long trip and I'm loaded up, I'll do my weight and balance with full fuel, and then I'll do my weight and balance with no fuel. And I'll connect the two dots and see if I stay in the CG during that entire time. But I must inter interrupt this brilliance to point out, you got really smart viewers. I, I'm impressed because we've got Ray Benza and Dude on Two Wheels. I don't think that's his real name, but I like it. <laughs> we'll call and uh, Raheem Murphy, all of whom knew that ramp weight doesn't take into account fuel burn, taxi, and run up. So it's the amount you can weigh on the ramp, but as you head on out to the runway, starting up, taxiing, doing your run up, you're going to burn some more. So it's just incrementally smaller for your maximum takeoff. I'm, I'm going to jump out on a limb here, Pat. I'm going to say Ray and Dude and Raheem, go ahead and shoot an email to jamie.beckett, just like it says there on the screen, jamie.beckett at aopa.org. Include your name and address. And I, I'm talking your physical address, not your email address. And I will send you a cool AOPA hat because I'm just that nice a guy. Aren't I, Pat? Did uh, you are. <laughs> and it'll probably look like the one you're wearing or it could be look like the one I'm wearing. I'm not sure what you've got in your stash. Oh, I, I've got stuff. It's <laughs> it's worth caring about. You know, you you were talking about the the way the CG can move when when the fuel burns or things move around. And that's something we don't think of often. You know, when I, I remember when I was flying Seneca's, um, if it was just the two of us up front, we needed about 90 pounds in the third row so that we, we stayed in the center of gravity. So you can't just assume that it's going to be okay because it's just you or just you and one other person or however it's loaded. You really do have to do the weight and balance. And Pat, I'm going to delve into the the most benign, most docile aircraft of all time, just an absolute favorite, the Cessna 152. You and I have both flown them. We both used them as company cars in our former job as ambassadors at AOPA. But yours had standard tanks, around 20 gallons worth of fuel. Mine had long-range tanks, 40 gallons worth of fuel. So mm -hmm. you could get into that airplane and go, oh, I've flown lots of 152s, and I told the guy at the FBO to top it off, we're good. You and I could go in your 152 with full fuel, probably. We'd be close to it. Yeah. But in mine with full fuel, by the time I got in with my flight bag, I had 32 pounds left. So just because you've flown that type of airplane, that doesn't mean you can fly this airplane loaded the same way. And that's why I know it seems weird, but you have to actually remind people weight and balance isn't an inconvenience. It's absolutely critical, important 
to the safe termination of your flight. Things yeah, happen I, if you I, violate I, that. That that's right. I've got uh, I've got a, a fair amount of Malibu time, and with two people in the cockpit uh, on a Malibu, you're actually outside the forward CG. Not by much, mm -hmm. but you're outside the forward CG. So you got to put a case of oil or you know a sandbag or something in a lead shot or something in yep. the back, you know, just to bring you uh, within within that CG. Uh, I remember one time several years ago, we. Um, we flew we flew a matrix which is a non-pressurized malibu um to to oshkosh and there were uh five of us in the airplane now that's a six place airplane but once again good luck getting six people in that airplane with full tanks and I, if i remember right it's 120 gallons and so uh once again um i sat down with the uh with the guy that was going to be doing most of the flying i was in the right seat he was in the left and, and we actually pulled out the weight and balance and we did a very, very careful, careful calculation on, on the five of us, the bags that we were going to have with us and how much gas with, the, with that weight as a constant, how much gas can we put in? Mm -hmm. And it turned out that we could, we could put in enough that we could comfortably uh, fly two legs, but we would have to stop for gas. And so we flew up to, I think it was Jefferson County, Missouri or something, stopped for lunch, put in 60 gallons of gas or whatever it was. And um, uh, up to 60 gallons, I think is what it was. And then we, so basically half, half tanks coming home, we had a sixth person with us. And so again, carefully calculating, we were well within the envelope, but we only had enough gas to be able to make, uh, well, we had to make two stops, so three legs. And now they're perfectly safe. We were we were always well, well beyond the, the 30 minute minimum that was required for VFR, uh, VFR flight a day. But because um, um, uh, I'm not comfortable with 30 minute reserve. I mean, I, I don't yeah. care what the regs say. I'm not comfortable during the daytime, even the daytime with a 30 minute reserve. Imagine you're planning your cross country somewhere and you're planning X ground speed or something, and you've got a five knot wind stronger than you expected it to be, and it's not on your tail. All of a sudden, you're two or three minutes late to each checkpoint, and you've got five or ten checkpoints, and oh boy, you better be looking for some place to land, and let's hope that the airports that you're flying over have those little tick marks that say that they have services, and then you better be sure that they've actually got the gas because the truck might have not made it that week. Um, depending on where that airport is. I've had that happen before. So, uh, you know. Uh, I've had the card reader, not the tank's full, but the card reader doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So all kinds of little things like that, that that can happen. And, you know, it happens to you once and it's kind of, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, <laughs> shame on me. <laughs> yeah, I had a couple friends years ago who were flying from Connecticut down here to Florida to go to Sun and Fun. And they were flying in a Cessna 140. And of course, two adult males in a 140, you're you're getting pretty near the limit. And that was their thing. They stopped every 100 miles and got six gallons of fuel. And then they'd go another 100 miles. But I'm completely with you on the 30-minute fuel reserves thing. And and you know, Pat, I'm a, I'm a longtime believer in the concept that just because it's legal doesn't mean it's not stupid. So, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> That's a minimum. That's not a suggestion. That's like, don't get past that. I um, I generally in the 152, which has a little better than three hours endurance, I won't go over two. Yeah. I just I want to have that because, as you say, I've I've been on flights before where I get to my destination. And for whatever reason, that little non towered single runway airport, the runway is closed. And it, it was open when I departed, but it's not now. And it's kind of nice if that next runway is a distance away. I don't want to be sweating that last little bit. Although that's not, strictly speaking, a weight and balance issue, is it? No, no. That's more of a human endurance issue. But I'll tell you that it does bring me bring up to uh, top of mind. And, and we've talked about this, I think, before in previous uh, Ask an Ambassador. But I remember my wife and I were flying to Michigan for a high school class reunion several uh, years ago. I won't tell you what number that reunion was, but it was. Especially uh, if it's hers. It, no, it was mine. <laughs> and it, the, the numbers are getting disturbingly large. I'll just say that. Um, but uh, we were flying the Cirrus and the straight line distance between Houston and, and our fuel stop was about three and a half hours. 
And the, the flight was a flight plan for a total of a, about six hours, maybe not quite. And there was a line of thunderstorms and weather that was right smack dab in between us and our, and our first destination. And so we had to work our way around and, and, and uh, around it with the help of ATC. We were talking to ATC the entire time on an IFR flight plan. And uh, it, it, it had added an hour, almost an hour and a half to our flight. And that, that made that first leg five hours. Um, the longest leg that I'd flown before that was about four and a half. And at that, I was ready to get out of the airplane. Um, so I can tell you that about four hours, uh, I'm starting to look at the fuel and I'm starting to think, am I going to have to divert? And I'm looking at the fuel burn and the fuel totalizer and doing some calculations and confirming that what I'm seeing on the screen is in fact what, what in other words, can I believe it? And, um, and I figured uh, that I could, and I was confident enough in that, that we went ahead and completed that first leg. When we put, in, when we put the gas in the airplane, uh, I, it turned out that I had just a little over an hour's gas remaining which pretty much was what I calculated we would have. But again, that doesn't have a lot to do with the weight and balance issue, except that it does get it down to kind of minimum fuel and where, which way is that CG moving? And fortunately in the Cirrus, it doesn't move down and back. So, you know, we were good. Yeah, that's excellent. By the way, you mentioned something before that I kind of let gloss past that I really shouldn't have. Just because an airplane has four seats or six seats doesn't mean it's a four-seater or a six-seater. <laughs> and what's coming to mind particularly are things like the Cherokee 140 or the PA-16. They've got four seats. But if you put four modern adult humans who love cheeseburgers and pizza in those, it's not going to work out well. I mean, you might get off the ground and you might fly. And that's the great risk of it to my mind, Pat. Exceeding weight and balance limits isn't something that bites you immediately, generally. You actually get into the air and overstress the airplane, or you get into the air and find out you're, you're too far forward on the CG and you're excessively stable, or too far aft and excessively unstable, and as you said, you're in real trouble now because you just can't well, get the nose down. Well, yeah, and, and beyond that, it's like, well, you know, I did it, I did it once before and, and it was fine um, uh, when it was... 30 degrees outside, 30 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Yeah, what I, I can do it again, but oh, it's 90 degrees outside today. Um, yeah. So it's it's not it's not just you know it's 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 that complacency, it's it's that uh, normalization of deviation. You know, we've talked about that here uh, so many many times before. Um, people, I mean, we're all guilty of it, and you know, in one degree or another, we are all guilty of it. But you kind of get away with doing something uh, one time, and you think, well, you know, that can't be very important then because I got away with it. And then you do it again, but maybe, you know, maybe I was five pounds over last time. Well, five, five, how much, how much worse can seven pounds be? Or you know, I'm 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 supposed to be flying at 2,000 feet, but I'm showing 1,900. It's only 100 feet. Um, I, I had a uh, talking about normalization of deviation. I had a check ride a while back. It was a commercial check ride, and we entered the traffic pattern at 100 feet above traffic pattern altitude. And um, and I made a note of it and asked the applicant, you know, why are we flying at 1,200 feet? And he said, well, I just fly, I feel more comfortable flying at 1,200 feet. Um, and, and I said, uh, okay, he, uh, okay. And he said, yeah, cause it's, it's only a hundred feet. So I just made a note and we got down on the ground and, and we were debriefing cause it was a good ride other than a couple of that and a couple of little things. And we were debriefing and I said, so, so it's only a hundred feet, right? He said, yeah, it's only a hundred feet. And I said, well, okay. Uh, tomorrow I'll let you and I go fly, uh, and let's uh, put you under the hood or we'll go find actual instrument conditions and uh, the minimums at our airport are 540 feet, but hey, we'll just go down to 440 because it's, it's only 100 feet. And you can see the light bulb go off in his brain that, mm -hmm. oh, oh. <laughs> there's probably a reason that there are standards that say that this is what it's supposed to be. So, you know, you can apply that to flying, flying fat, you know, flying your airplane overweight. You can apply that to well, it was a little forward CG last time, but everything is fine. I got the nose up. You know, I didn't prank anything when I landed, blah, 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 blah. You can justify it. You can try to, 
you know, you can try to justify it all you want to. You can, you can, uh, um, but at, at some point, normalization of deviation, you're going to, you're going to deviate too far from normal and it's going to bite you. You know, and that's such a human trait. You you say normalization of deviation, which is a much better term. I just think of it in terms of rationalization. That whole it's only 100 feet thing, not to make fun of the guy, but from pattern altitude saying it's only 100 feet is one thing. Standing on the ground looking at a 100-foot tower, you're like, wow, that's tall. You know, it's, it's all how you look at it, but rationalizing that that deviation is no big deal like you say, it's going to bite you. Even the the seven pounds over, people will say, well, I'm taking off seven pounds over. It's okay because, you know, in, in an hour or so, I'll have burnt that off. Well, maybe, but you might also stress the aircraft. It's kind of like those people who do aerobatics in aircraft that aren't intended to do aerobatics and they get away with it. Yeah. And they don't realize they're overstressing the airframe little by little. And, and right. they're, there's fasteners and there's all sorts of things that are getting worked that weren't supposed to be able to be worked that hard. It might not fail on you, but somewhere down the line, it's going to fail on somebody. And that's not great. So we do have to pay attention to what is our maximum takeoff weight? What is VA at this weight in under these conditions? And don't yeah. rationalize that. I'm only off by a little bit. Well, yeah, get back in the ballpark. That's, that's yeah. better. And, and, you know, if, and if you want to look at it from a, uh, from another standpoint in just, just to try to put the fear of God in you. Um, what happens if something happens on takeoff and you auger in somewhere and what's going to happen eventually is the FAA is going to be on site and the NTSB is going to be on site and they're going to be taking all kinds of measurements about your takeoff distance and your takeoff weight and the fuel on board and all of these things. Um, and they're going to come away with the uh, conclusion that you were overweight on takeoff. You were exceeding the limitations of the airplane. Um, so where, as you might have simply gotten off with a, an expensive insurance claim because of maybe a legitimate engine failure, you may also um, have gotten some sort of a sanction from the FAA for taking off overweight and exceeding the limitations of the airplane. And your insurance company very well may come back and say that was a contributing factor to the damage that was done on the airplane on the on the landing and possibly um, refuse to pay that claim. So, you know, when, when you're flirting around with the edges of acceptability, whether it's weight and balance or, you know, cloud clearance and visibility requirements in various spaces, airspaces or what have you, you're really opening yourself up to. Um, some unpleasant things, including perhaps a 709 ride. It would, uh, you know, the FAA would certainly be within their right to to require that you be re-examined for the privilege of holding a pilot certificate if you were to um, experience a, an issue uh, on in your airplane um, and and they found it to be um, overweight or something other than than it should be you're really opening yourself up to some re-examination um issues um and insurance issues as i said before yeah you know one of the things i think we've got to address is um people have a tendency to sort of get away from doing their weight and balances and a lot of us do that i think but <clears throat> pardon me they figure who's gonna know yeah. What difference does it make? And I fly from point A to point B, and it's it's 200 miles, it's 300 miles, whatever it is. And at the other end, I get out of the airplane, and my three buddies get out of the airplane, and we pull a couple suitcases out and maybe a, a set of golf clubs. And there happens to be an FAA guy on the field having lunch or visiting the 141 school. And they're just thinking, I don't think that's right. And as you say, it's not like you can say, oh, I just I, I lost the weight and balance sheet, but I did it. OK, well, I know where you came from and I know where you are now because we got ADSB and I know how much fuel that takes. Let's weigh you guys and all your stuff. And you're right. That opens you up to ninety one thirteen at the very least, careless and reckless. And now your insurance company is saying, wait a minute, what's going on here? I don't like this. And, you know, it's 
you really do want to take this stuff seriously. And as I said earlier, you might just, if you and your spouse fly routinely together, you might just do a weight and bounce for the two of you and keep it in your, in your bag. And you always fill the fuel to that same level and you know you're in good shape. But yeah, you, you, we've got to stay on our toes because we got to remember this is actually about safety. It's not about somebody looking over our shoulder. It's about being safe. And that yeah. takes commitment. Yeah. And, you know, if you're flying an airplane, as you said, in kind of a similar configuration time after time after time, uh, running one weight and balance and, and uh, uh, hanging on to that is probably plenty adequate. You know what the performance of the airplane is going to be on any given day uh, with, uh, you know, with two people and half tanks, for example. The airplane is going to get off the ground. It's going to be just fine. Um, and there's nothing in the regs that says that you have to have that weight and balance, calculated weight and balance on board. You do have to have the weight and balance for the airplane on board, but there's nothing that says you have to, the calculations that you did at home or, you know, on your cell phone before you took off or, or on four flight or what have you, never, nothing says that it has to be in the airplane. It just says that you got to run the numbers. <clears throat> so, um, you know, it, it, it would be reasonable if an inspector did do, as you suggested, Jamie, uh, to say, you know, when you get home, send me those calculations. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you hadn't done those calculations, you you better do them real quick. <laughs> and, it, you know, it's unfortunate that people don't do it because it's never been easier. As you say, you've got four flight. You can do weight and balance right there. And if you're flying the same plane or the same five planes on a regular basis, <clears throat> You're going to have the empty weight in there. You can have the fuel capacity. You can have your weight. And all you have yeah. to do is add the baggage or the other passengers. It's fairly easy and it's right there in your phone or your iPad. Yeah. That's it, takes, you know, it, it takes a little time to set that stuff up. Um, uh, I remember when I was setting up the weight and balance on, I think it was on the Comanche. Um, I, you know, I just, I, I was just kept doing something wrong. I don't, I don't know what it was. And it probably took me, 30 minutes or 45 minutes to, to figure out what I was doing wrong and kind of get everything where it passed the smell test. In other words, I, I, I was, I was certain that, that what I had done was right. And when I would plug in random numbers, you know, where the, where the dot ended up looked right. Uh, in other words, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to load you know, arbitrarily. I'm not going to load like 300 pounds in the, in the baggage compartment, first of all, it's, it's placarded for less than that, but I'm not going to put 300 pounds in the baggage compartment and expect the airplane to be nose heavy, uh, you know, with me in the front seat, that, that doesn't pass the smell test. So, um, whenever you're running weight and balance, you know, it's kind of good to have an idea of, uh, where do you think it's going to end up? Uh, it's kind of like when you're planning, you know, when you're planning a cross country flight, if you're doing it the old fashioned way and using a plotter, and you're heading westbound, and the plotter says you're heading at zero nine or zero. That, that ain't right. <laughs> so, you know, some, some, it, it needs to it needs to pass the smell test. Yeah, that's true. And you know, there's something we haven't talked about in this. We have talked about the envelope, how it's four and a half, but it's also left and right. You know, I fly a high wing airplane, so I have the fuel on both most of the time because my hairstyle prefers the shady environment. But, you know, there are people who like low-wing airplanes. You, there's no accounting for taste. I think we, we've got uh, – Stephen Gansky is on here. He's got a Bonanza. It's a low-wing airplane. I get it. Some people prefer that. Something about the view. I don't know. But that also means we're pumping fuel uphill from the wing tanks, and we have to switch tanks as we go. There have been people I've come across in my career, Pat, and you will find this hard to believe, where they're only going on an hour leg or an hour and 15 minute leg. So they'll leave it on the same tank the whole time. And cause that way they don't have to switch in the air and maybe they're uncomfortable switching tanks. But you know, if you're burning 10 gallons an hour and you go for an hour and a half, you're 15 gallons lighter on one side. And that's a big weight difference. If you don't have aileron trim, you're starting to work harder to keep those wings level. And this is starting to fatigue the pilot you really do have to keep into account that weight left and right. It's not just fore and aft. It's, it's yeah. both sides. And if you look at some airplanes, Cirrus in particular has a 10 gallon weight imbalance limit. So really? uh, yeah. So I'm 60 pounds. So, you know, they, they want you switching back and forth. So there's a 10 gallon imbalance there. So 
Um, I, I just think it's 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 good practice. Now, you know, you talk about a high wing airplane. You know, you're an A and P. You worked on a bunch of them. How many high wing airplanes do you know of that will draw equally from both tanks? The specific number is zero, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not even you're not even questioning that it is zero. Oh no! If you have <laughs> if you tend to fly a little heavy on one foot or the other, or if you let it bank just a little bit. Yeah, you're, you're not going to end up with the same. And anybody who flies a high wing knows that when they go to get fuel, it takes X number of gallons in the left wing and X plus five on the other side. And you're like, how did that happen? Well, probably the bubble wasn't in the middle. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah and, God, and God forbid you should park on a ramp that's slightly uneven and the, and the vent line is on the, on the downwinds, down, the downhill side of that. <laughs> yeah, because you're, yep. you're unless you turn the fuel valve off, you're going to vent a whole lot of gas on the pavement. That's true. Um, by the way, we've got and I, I will butcher this name and I'm sorry, but F.A. Sem Elsie is from Istanbul, Turkey is on with us. I like that. Folks, tell tell us um, where you're from in the comments. Go ahead and mention because Pat is in the Houston, Texas area which he's yeah. very proud of. We don't know why, but he likes it there, and that's okay. And I'm in Central Florida in a lovely town called Winter Haven, which, as I've told Pat many times, proven by science to be the best place on the planet. I don't know why anybody would disagree with that, but let us know where you're from because I am curious. And Ted McDavid is backing you up, by the way, that there are several apps that provide excellent weight and balance tools. They're very helpful. And, you know, I got to admit, if you've got tools, use them. Because it's just yeah. a simple algebra problem. It's really well, not that complicated. You yeah. don't even have to know it's algebra. It's just pretty simple. But yeah, the problem, problem is that Ted, Ted, Ted's trying to show how smart he is now that he's got his instrument rating. Well, I would brag all I could. And you know what you should do, Ted? You could say, not only do I have my instrument rating, my ride was with Pat Brown. That's <laughs> something. That was work. <laughs> so we got James Goodman's in Abilene, Texas, practically next door to you. Oh, yeah. Big Crab Bob is in Beaumont area of Texas. I like it there. That's all a nice right. area. Beaumont's a little closer to Abilene, but that's all right. Lincoln's in Columbia, Missouri. We've got Mandeville, Jamaica for Raheem. Wow. Um, oh, and FASM Elsie says that was a good pronunciation. So I didn't screw it up so horribly. Excellent. My high school language teachers would be so pleased. I hope that uh, I hope that you are not too terribly affected by those earthquakes over there. We are sure uh, watching that. Yeah. With just sad disbelief. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we've all suffered natural disasters in some way, but that just looks so challenging. So yeah. all our best to you, bud. Uh, we got Colin in Oregon, Mr. Dr. Lewis. I have not met a Mr. Dr. before, so I'm excited about this. Mr. Dr. Lewis is in Montana. I, I know people in Montana. Mary yeah. Martin's in Savannah, Georgia. Now that's a cool town. I like that. Uh, Skeevan Gansky is 30 miles north of Philly. My condolences on the Super Bowl, sir. Hope you do better <laughs> next year. Um, and I'm not a Chiefs fan. I didn't even watch the game. I just saw it on the news. Um, Ray Benza is in Lebanon, Ohio. Doug Beck in Lincoln, Nebraska. Mark Milne in South Africa. You know, we have coworkers in South Africa today, so... Very cool. You may bump into them. P. Wood is in Newmarket, Maryland, practically at headquarters. And, um, oh, Colin D. is from Jamaica as well. We have Philip Isley in Chesapeake, Virginia. I cannot believe we have people all over like this, Pat. It's phenomenal. Oh, all over I, the world. I love it. You know, that is what has been so gratifying about this gig, though. Being an ambassador with AOPA, working with you and, and the whole crew, being able to interact with all these folks. Folks, I hope you have gotten something out of these episodes and that you've enjoyed them and even a little bit as much as Pat and I have because it really has been a joy bringing these. Um, Pat, if someone were watching tonight, I mean, theoretically, there may be somebody in the audience. You don't know. One or two. If they said to themselves, that Pat Brown guy seems smart. Jamie's kind of weird, but that Pat Brown guy is bright. How would somebody get in touch with you to ask a question or mail you a fruitcake at the holidays or whatever, what would be their best way of getting you? Well, first of all, I would compliment them on being so astute, but. Definitely. <laughs> but uh, just look there on the screen. That is my email address. Uh, it's 
first name dot last name at aopa.org. So pat.brown at aopa.org. I really do answer my email uh, emails uh, just like Jamie. Uh, you know, we, we like hearing from uh, from folks out there and and uh, and love getting questions and things like anything that we can do to help. We really genuinely do enjoy what we do and look at it as a privilege um, uh, to do that. So uh, strongly encourage uh, saving those email addresses, pat.brown at aopa.org or jamie.beckett. And he's with the 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 Beckett's of two T's in the in the Beckett name, uh, oh, yeah. high class Beckett's. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So uh, we wear a tie at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this has been a great pleasure doing all this stuff. Pat, I've enjoyed every minute we've done with this. For the audience, I'm not talking to you, Pat. I'm talking to the audience now. You can probably tell there's some friction between Pat and I. There's yeah. clearly a Florida, Texas rift going on. We both are musicians, but we, we don't play each other's music. It, it's very tense between us. But we're here to serve you. So completely ignore that part. And, and I'll just tell you, I think there's a real good possibility we'll be back in some form or fashion right here on your internet at some point in the not too distant future. I don't know what it's going to look like. Do you, Pat, you have any insight into what it might be? No clue, but it, whatever it is, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be a job, Jamie, because I got to deal with you. <laughs> you know, the thing is, this has been the great byproduct of the COVID thing and because AOPA really is very focused on getting out, serving members, serving the pilot and aircraft owner community, doing what we can to make you as informed, educated, and aware as possible. And if possible, maybe entertain you just a tiny little bit. So we ended up doing an awful lot of online stuff during COVID, which we persisted in. And it's not just us. There's there's Ask the AMPs, and there's the Don't Get Rusty webinars, and there's just all sorts of stuff. So I'm going to suggest, Pat, that anybody who's interested, AOPA member or not, go to the Air Safety Institute webpage, which is just fantastic. There's videos, there's stories, there's quizzes, there's all kinds of stuff. Almost all of it's available to people, whether you're a member or not. And you will become a safer, better, more aware pilot. And, and I think that's one of the greatest resources we offer. Pat, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Is there anything that you find particularly beneficial or worthwhile that you would love to leave with these folks before we part for the evening and go to our various Valentine's Day festivities? Yeah, I got to take my wife out to dinner here pretty soon. She's she's getting ornery, hangry, I think is the word. Uh, no, she's she's great. Um, she must be pretty good. She gave me this card earlier, so I thought Ooh. you know she must like me a little bit. Um, well, you know, actually, um, if if those of you that may be fairly new to the Ask the Ambassador uh, uh, webinars, webcast, whatever you call this thing we're doing, um, you can actually find a lot of uh, a lot of these are, are on uh, are on AOPA's website. If you have problems finding it, I'm going to do a, a shameless plug right here. But if you if you do have problems finding it on AOPA's website, they're also on my uh, DPE website, which is HoustonDPE.com, www.HoustonDPE.com. Let me repeat that, www.HoustonDPE.com. And, and all, of, all of them that we have done are there. So if you can't find it on AOPA's website, go ahead and go to HoustonDPE.com. And, uh, but otherwise, um, you know, I, I really like the, uh, the online, the online, um, uh, courses that, that 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 we have, and and you know as much as I don't want to end talking about accidents, we have some really really good videos on accident analysis. Um, I mean they're just superb. We have such a tremendously gifted uh, group of videographers and storytellers in Frederick. Um, we really do, and, and we're, we're and our members are really blessed with with having that level of talent uh, at Frederick to produce the kind of stuff that we're able to produce, and it makes a difference. Um, the numbers, uh, I, the numbers are up, and I wish I could remember them to be able to tell you because I get those numbers every month for, uh, of, you know, how many views we've got. But it's in the millions of, of folks that have have looked at the the various uh, resources that 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 are that are up uh, there on our on the website. So AOPA.org, 
um, spend some time on it. It's, it's there's a lot of good information on there. So I agree. Thanks. I do that stuff quarterly. There are so many good courses, whether it's on weather or transitioning to different aircraft or instrument flight, flying into towered airports, non-towered airports. There's so much to choose from. I just every quarter I go in and take one of those courses and it just helps keep me aware of what's going on. Great recommendation, Pat. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're a very nice boy. You've you've come along well. And by the way, uh, Lawrence Kensky has written in and says, can I pay for Twitter here? And as a matter of fact, unusual as it may seem, you can. Shoot me an email. And, and I have a slightly different pay scale than the normal Twitter people do. But I also have a Cybertruck on order. So you might be able to help me out. We'll, we'll work that out. <laughs> Thanks for the offer, Lawrence. And by the way, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I feel compelled to say that, but thank you. And also, I got to say thank you to Donnie McKay, who produces this episode, Rebecca Boone, who has also produced some, some of the Ask an Ambassador episodes, just done a great job. I hope you're all doing a round of applause at home for Donnie and Rebecca, who are behind the scenes and really did pull this all together. Pat, it has been a great pleasure being an ambassador beside you. I, I have enjoyed every minute of it since the first day we met. And by the way, Pat actually knows Ringo. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. That's how cool he is. Um, and seriously, this has been great. We're both still with AOPA, but in a different capacity at the AOPA Foundation. And uh, do you have anything you want to say on the way out the door, Pat? Because this is it. We're, we're closing up shop. Well, I keep trying to get you to sing Happy Trails with me when we sign off a rough, rusty pilot. and you just, They're all you just, out of tune, Pat. Every single one of them is out of tune. I just don't have the time. So acapella? Nothing? I can't get oh, anything? No. <laughs> You've heard Tom Waits, right? <laughs> Obscure Very cultural similar. reference there. So, <laughs> yes, I have one of my favorite songwriters, as a matter of fact. There you um, go. Anyway, uh, now I just, man, I've had a great time. It has been, it really has been awesome. It's been a privilege. We've been doing this for nearly two years, I guess. Uh, yeah. Twice, twice a month for, for two years. And it has been one of the high points of my month every other Tuesday night to be able to sit down here and, and to tell lies and, and make up answers if we don't know the real ones. Uh, so it's been lots of fun, my friend. And I will see you at some point. And uh, but we'll be talking on the phone. I know uh, many, many, many times here in the near future. And for those of you out in video viewer land, if you see either one of us on a ramp, come up and say hi. You really can shoot us an email if you have a question. And it's entirely possible you bump into us at Sun and Fun or Air Venture or whatever. So seriously, come by because you never know. If you know a trivia question, I might have a hat for you. Folks, thanks so much for watching. Pat, I've really enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you so much for being my partner. I'll see all of the rest of you somewhere. somewhere. Thanks a lot. Have a great Hasta night. Tacos, everybody. Bye-bye. Oh, and, and happy Valentine's.